We're going to be in the book of Zephaniah tonight, so I'm going to give you just a minute uh, to find that because that's not a a book that you probably uh, spend a lot of time in or have heard a lot of sermons or Sunday school lessons in. We're in Zephaniah chapter 3. I thought I would preach a happy little message to you tonight. Uh, I mean, you know, like the last sermon before on going on vacation, um, I'm happy, I want you to be happy. I, I thought we would talk about, you know, better days, happier times. Because, uh, you know, if you, if you, which I highly encourage you not to, not to watch a lot of news. I've, I've told you that before. You know, my, my prescription for your spiritual health is watch the least amount of news that you can. Watch more Andy Griffith, you'll be a lot better off. But, uh, you know, if you, if you do watch any news, it's not, it's not a happy time in our world, it seems like. Uh, so I thought we would take a look at happier days, better days coming. So hopefully you found your place now. I'm in Zephaniah chapter 3. I'm going to get, begin with verse 8. Therefore wait for me, says the Lord. Until the day I rise up for plunder, my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation. All my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the people a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me, for then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments, He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let your hands be weak. Uh, uh, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who <clears throat> afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Happy days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight. I thank you, Lord, for your word, and I thank you for the privilege of being able to preach it tonight, Lord. And I thank you for the promise that we find in your word that better days are coming because Jesus is coming back. God, I pray that you'd speak to us tonight, that you'd give me what I'm supposed to say and the power to say it, Lord. Speak peace to us tonight, God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Happy days. So, what is the... Happiest thing you can think. If I if I were to tell you, ask you tonight, what's the happiest thought you can think of? What would that be? I tell you, <laughs> we gotta, you got a hey, you gonna answer? Go ahead. Becoming a mom is the happiest thing you can think of. Getting my kids grown was the happiest thing I could think of. <laughs> I don't, you know, uh, I guess everybody has their little, their little thing that they're, you know, that, that they think, their little happy thought that they go to. Uh, Lisa said that, you know, a, a Christian concert was, she always pictured heaven like a Christian concert, you know, where everybody was there and 
happy and praising the Lord. To me, I always thought of Six Flags. Like as a kid growing up, I always, you know, people said heaven is the ha- the happiest thing you could think of. The happiest thing I could think of was Six Flags. So I, you know, I mentioned that in a youth group one time, and they laughed at me. They said, "What do you think we're going to be riding the log flume down the river of life?" Ha 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 ha. So I decided that, you know, I learned real quick that you keep some of your thoughts to yourself when you're dealing with youth. Um, but here's the thing. The happiest day you've ever experienced in this life, whatever that is, that one, that one day that you could point to and say, this right here was the happiest day in my whole life. Whatever that is, whatever that was, it pales in comparison to how great it's going to be when Jesus comes back. I mean, what an awesome thought. This is sort of an end times message um, but I, but I want you to see tonight that this is one of those prophecies of the Old Testament, and we've seen these before, that there's sort of an already and not yet element to it. In other words, it, there's part of, it's partially fulfilled in things that have already happened, but there's certainly an element of it that is yet to be fulfilled and won't be fulfilled until Jesus comes back. Zephaniah was a prophet that ministered during the reign of King Josiah. Um, Josiah was, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Zephaniah was the great, great grandson of uh, Hezekiah. So he had seen good times in Israel. He had also uh, seen troubled times. And and he uh, he is now ministering to... um, to a people that, that need a word of encouragement. Um, this, these verses, this prophecy, it finds partial fulfillment in the exile and the return of, from the exile, the, 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 the exile of the people of Israel and the return from exile, it sees partial fulfillment in the birth of Christ, but it finds its ultimate fulfillment in the return of Christ and the establishment of His kingdom here on earth, or we might say the millennial kingdom. He says in verse 8, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord. This is the message that God has for His people Wait for me. The idea there is there's a day of the Lord that's coming. And in Scripture, when, when the day of the Lord is, is spoken of or talked about, it usually means two things. It usually means a day of judgment for the enemies of God's people, but it means a day of vindication and rejoicing for God's people. And so we see kind of both of those elements at work here. Wait for me, God says, because things are going to be good. And I think if there's something we need to hear in our world today as the people of God, I think it's the voice of God saying to us, wait for me. You turn on the, you turn on the, the news, it's all bad. You know, our, our, I mean, they're talking about our own president is using words like uh, nuclear Armageddon. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it's all, I grew up in the Cold War, so I, I, I lived with that as a kid growing up, wondering and worrying that somebody was going to push the button and the world was going to come to an end. It didn't come to an end uh, when I was a kid, and I don't believe it's going to come to an end by somebody pushing a nuclear button, I believe it's going to come to an end when God brings it to its culmination. But every, everywhere you look, it seems like it's bad news. And, you know, and it, and it doesn't just stop with on the world stage. It comes, it comes home to Claremore. I mean, there, it, you know, in our own life and living this, you know, living life is hazardous to your health if you hadn't figured that out. And so it, it seems like there's always bad news and it seems like bad days pile up more than good days uh, a lot of times. And so we, we, we get beaten down by this world. And we need to hear the voice of the Lord saying, just wait, 
hang in there. Wait for me. The day of the Lord is coming. And for those of us that know God, that's a good thing. Because He's coming back. People sometimes say, I don't know what this world is coming to. My answer to that is it's coming to an end. Uh, but Jesus is going to come back and He's going to fix it all. It's not, I'm convinced it's not going to get a whole lot better until He comes back. But He's going to come back and He's going to fix everything that's wrong. He's going to fix this mess that, that our world is in because it's in this mess because sin is in the world and our world is cursed because of sin. But Jesus is coming back and He will fix the problem. And so tonight I'd just like for us to look at how God is going to fix this mess. How God is going to fix this mess. And the first way uh, that the prophet says is that He's going to take away our judgments. He's going to take away our judgments. Verse 9, the Lord speaking by way of the prophet says, Then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. The idea there being that they will worship in truth. That, that there will no, no longer be a vile tongue. There will no longer uh, be uh, divided interest in, in and, and divided language that would, that would not be glorifying to God. That we'll all speak the language of truth, the language of the Spirit is the idea there. Jesus said, the time is coming and now is, when the true worshipers of God will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And He speaks of a time when evil will be judged. He says, I will restore the peoples of pure language that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. Um, look at verse 8. Wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation and my fierce anger. In other words, all of the nations of the world that have taken their stand against God and His people, He's going to call them all to a great big meeting. But the, the meeting is going to be, He's going to call them together and He's going to pour out His wrath on them. He, what you need to take out of this is, is, is this, if I can boil it down into its simplest terms. And that is, evil will be judged. And, and God and His people will win out in the end. And that's good news. We don't want to live in a world where evil will not be judged. We want to live in a world where, where right prevails and evil will be judged. That, uh, that, God will, that God will vindicate His people. He makes reference here to uh, bringing people beyond the rivers uh, of Ethiopia. My worshipers will come. However far we've been scattered, God's going to bring us back. I think that's exciting. Um, you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've had people ask questions. You, you'd be surprised. One of the, this, is, this is a little bit of preacher trivia that people don't know. One of the biggest questions uh, that I get asked as a preacher is, is cremation prohibited in the Bible? I mean, you, you wouldn't think that that would be the question that people ask, but that's what I get asked more than anything. Does the Bible say anything about cremation? Because, I mean, apparently some churches or some religions teach that, well, if you burn up the body, then, you know, there's nothing to resurrect. My answer of that, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, my answer is that there's nothing in Scripture that prohibits uh, cremation. If you're asking me personally, I don't want to be cremated. I've spent my life trying to stay out of the fire. The last thing I want to do is be thrown in it when I'm dead. Uh, and I've made that wish known to Lisa. So, uh, but, but I'm not going to know the difference. But here's the thing. If God is powerful enough to resurrect a body that's buried, He's powerful enough to resurrect ashes. The, talk, the, the, the Bible talks about the sea giving up its dead. You know, the, what about the, the astronauts that died in the Challenger explosion? You know, I mean, they, they, you know there, there was no body left. And, and, and some of them, is, 
I don't know. I'm not going to get into all the details of all of that. But but I, there's there's not a, there wasn't anything left when it was said and done. Our God is powerful enough to resurrect all of that. We no matter how far you, you get gone, when it comes time to come home, God can bring us all back together. Um, now I love this language. He says in verse 11, in that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. This is one of the passages, and, and you know, people, people differ on their opinion. Is this was this is this really talking about end times or, or was it all fulfilled with the return of the exiles? This is one of the verses that make me convinced that it's talking about more than just the return from exile. Because the people came back, but the shame was still there. Their, their sins were punished, but the shame was still there. This talks about a time when we will no longer be ashamed for our sin. Not, not only that our sins have been forgiven, but that we won't be ashamed of it anymore. What, what, a, what a beautiful thought. But it also says in verse 11 that we'll no longer be haughty. It seems as though that, that we'll understand that we don't have to bear shame for, for our guilt and our transgressions against God because God Himself took care of it. Not because we were good and we were righteous, but because God took care of it. So the, the pride will be gone. The haughtiness will be gone. Uh, and what will remain will be God's people forgiven and cleared of shame, humbly walking with Him, which is the way it's supposed to be all along. Verse 13 says, They, they shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies. Again, this is, this is one of the things that makes me convinced that it's talking about a time yet to come because we've not experienced that yet. People still do unrighteous things. People still speak lies. But there's coming a day when Jesus comes back that that will be taken care of. Evil will be judged. And, and our sin will be taken away and our shame will be taken away and in its place will be humility and righteousness and truth and we'll know keenly, we'll be keenly aware of where that came from. You know... I believe that we will remember for all eternity what our sins cost God. I think we will remember the blood that was shed for our sins. But I believe that we will remember it in happier times. And, and, and the shame will be gone. And so will the pride. And we'll re we will remember the love and the sacrifice that set us free. You know, I think it's interesting in San Antonio. San Antonio is like a fun place to go. I mean, it's like a, one of the one of the the most fun places you can get to in a, in a in a day's drive, probably. Um, yeah, I guess you you can get there in a day if you if you push it. Um, I mean, they got everything there. They got Sea World. They got Fiesta Texas. They've got the river walk, and they've got all these cool little shops along the river walk, and all these little arcades and stuff. And right downtown, and I'm talking about like right downtown, there's the Alamo. So what? So you're you're you go to vacation, you go to San Antonio on vacation, and you're spending your time just just like having fun. It's like have fun. Every waking moment is having fun, having fun, and having fun. And you're thinking, man, this is one of the best times our family have ever had. And then you go to the Alamo. And it's a very somber experience. And you can't take pictures in there. And you can't, uh, you have to take your hat off. And you can't make a lot of noise because you're supposed to remember the sacrifice that was paid for you. The blood that was shed for you. And I always think when I, when I go there, I think, man, we're having so much fun today. And none of this would be possible. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to grossly oversimplify history for the point, purpose of making a point. But I always think to myself, 
none of this would be possible. None of the, the happiness that we're having today would be possible without the sacrifice that happened here. And so I remember the blood that was shed and the sacrifice that was paid in a lot happier days because it was, it was the sacrifice that made it possible because without the sacrifice, there wouldn't have been a Texas uh, and, and none of the things that we're free to do now would you be able to do there. I, I'm drastically oversimplifying Texas history to make a point. My point is this. I believe we will remember the cross for eternity, but I believe we will remember it in happier times. Because all will be peace and all will be joy and all will be love. And, and there will be no more bad times. It will all be good. But we will still remember the sacrifice and the blood that was shed to pay for our freedom, to pay for our life in Christ that allows us to enjoy those good times. He'll take away our judgments. Secondly, He'll cast out our enemy. He'll cast out our enemy. Verse 8 makes it clear that He's going to gather the nations for judgment. He says in verse, uh, He says, I will purge the nations. 13, I, I will... No one will make my people afraid. 19, I, I will deal with all who afflict you. <laughs> That's strong language. When, when God says, I'll deal with it, it's dealt with. Our side wins. And that's what we got to hang on to. Our side wins. And the question is not, is God on our side? The question was never, is God on our side? The question, because God is the side. The question is, are we on His side? There, there's there's two, two kinds of people in this world. There's those that are on God's side, and there's those that aren't. And evil will be judged, and our side wins. He's going to purge the nations, all the the world that takes their stand against God and His people. But it's the remnant that we're a part of as God's people. The remnant are the ones that come out on top. I love this language. No one will make them afraid. What, what makes you afraid now? Sometimes mean people can make you afraid. Bullies can make you afraid. Things going on in the world can make you afraid. And of course, the, our number one enemy is death because of our sin. The number, the number two, statistically, the second greatest fear that people have is death. Death ranks number two as to the, what people fear the most. Of course, you know what the number one fear is, right? Public speaking. So people would rather die than do what I do for a living. But, <laughs> but, but we don't have to be afraid. Our enemy, death, has been defeated. All of our enemies will be defeated. And then he says in verse 19, I will deal with those who afflict you. Now, I think that sounds to me like a dad. That sounds to me like God is talking like a dad about someone who's messing with his kids. And let me just tell you, God takes exception to those who, who mess with his kids. And I'm speaking in, in very anthropomorphic terms, but he, he takes exception to those who hurt his kids children. And like a dad would go out and defend his children, God says, I'm going to defend you. In the letter to, in, in, in Revelation, in the, the letter to the church of Philadelphia, Jesus says, I will make your enemies bow at your feet and know that I have loved you. All those hurts, all those pains, 
all of those scars that the world has sent our way. God's going to take care of it. God's going to deal with it. He'll cast out our enemy. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about who's going to hurt me. There's nobody left to hurt you. The, the only people left will be, will be us that all love God. And guess what? We'll love one another with a perfect love. Sometimes we hurt one another because we still have an element of sin in us. All that will be dealt with. It will all be gone away. We'll all love one another with a perfect love. We'll never, you won't ever have to go up to anybody afterwards and say, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. There won't be none of that. We'll all love one another with a perfect love. Third, he'll fix this mess because the king will be in our midst. The king will be in our midst. Jesus himself will dwell with us. What will it be like to see Jesus face to face? Can you imagine that? In verse 16 he says, In that, um, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let your hands... But let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness and he will quiet you with his love. He will, sing, he will rejoice over you with singing. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. Jesus himself will be our king. Here's the thing. In this country, we elect a new leader every four years. There... There won't be no elections. No elections in heaven. Hey, I got, me, I got my next sermon. How about that? No elections in, in heaven. <laughs> it sounds like heaven to me, doesn't it? They, you know, there won't, there won't be no elections. You won't be driving along and see a sign. Re-elect Jesus, King. He's, he won't ever be up for elections. He's going to be here. He's going to rule. And we're going to be with him. You see? And we're going to see Jesus face to face. I've stood on ground where I'm pretty sure Jesus stood. And a cold chill went down my back. Thinking, my Lord stood here. Where not you know, this is not a reconstruction. This is not a, an estimate. This is not church tradition. I mean, Jesus Christ stood right here. He preached right here. And it'll send a chill down your back. But I can't even begin to imagine. Stand and see Jesus face to face. What an awesome thought. And we get to do it for eternity. How grand will that be? He says this, he says, I will rejoice over you with gladness. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we need different things from God. Sometimes we need different things from sermons. Sometimes we need to hear a boiling sermon and, can, you know, where... You know, God stomps our toes and, and we're under heavy conviction and we leave crying and, you know, it feels like the, the earth is just going to swallow our, us up, pew and all, you know. Sometimes we need God to speak peace to us. Sometimes this whole world gets us down. We need God to just come and say, hey, better days are coming. This is what He says. Wait on me. Hang in there. Better days are coming. I, myself, Jesus Christ, I will be in your midst and I will reign as king. I will rejoice over you with gladness. You know, I think a lot of times we think about meeting Jesus and we think it's going to be a, a traumatic experience because all the bad that we've done, he's going to rehash. And the Bible says we'll give an account of that. But, you know, as I read it, I mean, the shame is gone and I think it's, and, and the sin is gone and I think it's just a, another way to praise Jesus. That all of that is gone now. And I don't read that Jesus is going to, you know, 
we're going we're gonna to look up at Jesus and he's going to say, stupid, stupid servant, you, you know what you're doing and you messed up and look at the mess that you made of things. I don't read that. I read where it says that Jesus will look at us <laughs> and rejoice over us. This is, this, is, this is my child that I love. And then it says he will quiet you with his love. Quiet, like, like a mother quiets her baby. You know, you, you, get, a, you get a baby that's, that's crying and fussing and they're, they're, they're not happy, they're not having a good time, but, but, but in a mother's arms, a mother can quiet that child with her love. And then he says this, he says, I'll sing over you. I'll sing over you. Again, that picture of, of, a, of a mother singing to our, uh, her children. I, I remember when our boys were babies, and Lisa would rock them in an old rocking chair, and she would sing them to sleep. And I thought that was the most peaceful thing. There are times that I, you know, the world was crashing in on me. I wished I could just crawl up in Lisa's lap and just let her sing me to sleep. She never, I couldn't fit, you know, it didn't work that way. But Jesus says, I'll sing over you. Speak peace and sing over you. You know, on our honeymoon, we went to Washington, D.C. and saw all the different monuments and things like that. But one of the things that I thought was kind of the most interesting was the White House. And, and it, it, was, it was really amazing to me, but I couldn't, we didn't have tickets. You see, you had to know somebody. You had to like, you know, um, you, you had to have a, an in. You had to, you know, know somebody that knew somebody to be able to get a ticket to actually tour the thing. So it ain't me. I ain't no senator's son. But anyway, that's a song reference if, if you all pick up on it. But... I had this surreal moment standing there looking at the White House like 600 yards away and thinking, that's where Bill Clinton lived. That's his house. I mean, he lives in a house just like I live in a house. That's, that's Bill Clinton's house. And that's as close as I could get to it. It was like 600 yards. You can go up in the Washington Monument and you can look out and you can look down at his backyard. It was really cool. But you know, I didn't get to go any closer than that. There was a big, a big, a big fence between me and that house. And there was um, Secret Service agents there. And I walked up and I and I was asking them about it and all this. And I was and I was asking, oh, what's all the room? What what's in that room? And, all that. and and they looked over their dark glasses and they said, can't answer that, sir, you need to move along. I, I, didn't get to, I didn't get to go see Bill, you know. I saw his house, but, I, but he didn't have me over for dinner. He did, I didn't get to go in, and he didn't, he didn't sing over me. But you know, there's coming a day when I'm going to meet somebody more important than the president. I'm going to meet the king face to face. And I'm not just going to get to see his house. I'm going to have a room in his house. And I'm going to be part, because I'm going to be part of the family. And he's going to sing over me. And I don't ever have to be worried or scared again. Because the king will sing peace to me. The king will be in our midst. And finally... He says, we'll see disaster no more. <laughs> Lord, we've seen enough disaster in this old world to suit all of us. But there's coming a day where we'll see disaster no more. Verse 19 speaks of a great in gathering. I will gather those who were driven out and appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. This great in gathering where we'll all be together as God's people. 
our great kingdom made up of all the peoples of the earth that know God. He says, I will return your captives. Um, and I, I, I believe that there's a double, a double fulfillment here. I think it's partially fulfilled in the return from exile, but I think, I, I think it's also a freedom from the captivity of sin. It's, it's talking in spiritual terms. We shall see disaster no more. What's the, what's the word that God has for you tonight? Wait for me. God, it looks so hard. It's so hard down here. And, the, and everything, all the news looks like bad news and, and, and bad people are doing bad things and it seems like there's hurt and tragedy everywhere. God, what am I supposed to do? Wait for me. I'm coming. It won't be long. And I'll fix it when I get here. When the boys were little, we, we talked about heaven a lot. We talked about Jesus coming back a lot. And Tom Parker, he wasn't, a very, he wasn't very old. He said, Dad, I, you know, I got to thinking about that. He said, everybody thinks and everybody's talking like Jesus is coming back like real quick, like in our lifetime. I said, yeah, I know. He said, but you know, people have been, he, people have been thinking that for 2,000 years. I said, I know. He said, he said, people right after Jesus left thought he was coming back. He hadn't come back yet. I said, you're, you're right. He said, what if, I mean, what if it's like nine gazillion years till he comes back? <laughs> Kids can ask questions that make you think a little bit. And so I did think a little bit. And I said, well, son, first of all, I don't think it's going to be nine gazillion years. I think, I think things are shaping up that it's going to be a lot quicker than that. But even if it was, even if it was nine gazillion years before Jesus comes back, let me tell you something, it's worth the wait. Hold on. Be faithful. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. And whether it's tomorrow or nine gazillion years down the road, Jesus, I promise you this, Jesus is worth the wait. So I leave you with, <laughs> with this word from the Lord while, till we can be back together again. God says this to you, wait on me. Better days are coming and I'll get it straightened out when I get here. Let's pray. God, thank you for what a, what a wonderful promise in your word, Lord. I pray that you would, uh, Lord, speak to us now. Lord, search our hearts, God, and see if there are decisions that we need to make. I pray that you would lead us to do that. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.